Good afternoon and welcome to Detailing in Revit Part 3. My name is Stan Henney with CAD 1 and on, uh, on keyboards today I have Brian Mackey, uh, president or owner or whatever you are of BD Mackey Consulting, one of the, one of the top uh, BIM consulting firms here in the country. So uh, we are pleased to bring this presentation to you. As we said, this is Part 3 and part one and part two have been recorded and do you have a link to them on your site Brian? I do not but they're on the CAD1 YouTube yes, channel. Yes they're on the CAD1 YouTube channel and you can go to the CAD1 site under events and then archives and you can find the links to all those. A little bit of ground school to get you started. Uh, if you're hearing us and hopefully you are then you know about the mic and speakers and telephone setting. Um, if you need to minimize the console to get it out of the way so you can see this full screen, hit the little orange arrow. There's the raise your hand button and most important, the ask questions button. Feel free to ask any questions that you have and we'll try and get them close, answered as close as we can to in context with the presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian and we'll go from there. So as we said, this is part three in the Revit Detailing series. If there is a part four that anybody wants to see, feel free to email us and maybe we'll add an additional part four to this. But in the past, we've talked about using detail components and doing tagging and making it all intelligent, not doing filled lines, not doing, um, not doing filled regions, not doing drafting lines, doing intelligent 2D information. So it is going to be more of standard details. As we've said in the past, you know, it's creating the content. Whether you're putting over the live 3D model, adding to the live 3D models with, with 2D components, or just simply creating standard details. We've, we've covered up the processes of that. We've talked about creating detail components and creating custom tags. I really want to start getting into some more advanced detail components by nesting those in and creating like assemblies for details, etc. So one of the big things we wanted to get into, and as Stan said, feel free to ask questions as we're going through this because we don't want to get to the end and be answering questions that were 20 minutes ago on that side of the thing. So we're going to go ahead and just really dive into Revit when we get into this and start talking about what we're going to be doing inside of the Revit world. So let me get into Revit here real quick. I can't even tell which one's Revit. Okay. So now that we've got Revit open and we're coming inside of here, we've talked about, you know, detailing and setting these details up. I really want to get into detail components. And I talk about a couple detail components and things that we can do, maybe not necessarily on the advanced side, but getting more into the, hey, we really want to come in here and get into the standard side. So I know I have some MEP engineers. I'm going to try to talk structurally. I'm going to try to talk architecturally. I don't know if there's going to be a whole lot of actual examples of MEP type information. Obviously, it's going to be the same content. But I really want to get into, and right now I'm just going to talk about um, the gypsum board. So gypsum board, no matter who's detailing, a lot of times we need to show gypsum board. And I want to kind of talk a little bit about a standard on something, what I've done with gypsum board. So I'm going to come in here and grab this gypsum board family. And for me, I always turn off all reference planes, dimension lines, etc. when we get inside of this family. So we can really start to see what's going on and how we're, we're getting inside of this. Oops. Brian, real quick, if I may, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the example, we've had these comments before, and the examples that Brian uses are just that, they're examples. Hopefully you can make the connection to how you might use that in your world, whether it's architecture, structure, MEP. And again, that's why we tell you, if... You know, you, you go, well, that's cool, but I do MEP. How might I do that with a MEP component or a structural component? Post that question so that we can help you out. Yeah, good point, Stan. So a couple of things I want to get inside of here and start talking about that just to speed up the process of this. So I'll just go ahead and load this into my project. Oh, it was already in my project. I said I need to load it. So when I'm grabbing this detail component, it's starting to think about more than just, hey, I've got this object, it's a done deal, I place it type scenario. So this gypsum wallboard detail component, I'm going to go find it real quick. It's a division, so it's under 09. I've kind of in this file got mixed things inside of here, so excuse me why I kind of fumble around looking for things. I've got some of my older stuff, I've got some newer stuff in this file. But this gypsum board component, it's a line-based detail component. We talked about kind of how to create that last time. When I start talking about getting in here and doing standards, it, it's thinking about more how we can use these detail component objects 
to really start coming in where we needed to do inside of here. Maybe we're going to want to come in here and start drawing the stuff at an angle, etc. And when I start doing this, I end up with situations like this. Maybe I end up with different scenarios. I have a lot of people who don't like, well, if this is just a continuation of a detail, I don't want to have to put a break line all the time. So simple things to start embellishing, making these components a little bit more intelligent. So when you start looking at these detail components that I do, any line-based detail component I create, I always have the capability to turn off the first pick point start line or the last pick point start line. So again, if I come down here, and those are just simple yes, no parameters. We're going to dive into that real quick. But I also always like to add the fact that I can come in here and put an angle on those objects. So if I'm truly getting into this and I want this to start looking like, hey, here we go. Here's the object. It's going across the screen. Well, you know what? I'm going to turn the lines off on this one as well. And then on this one, I'm going to go ahead and put, oops, not the inch mark. I'm dealing with angles here. Try that one more time. I'm going to come in here and put the angle that I'm dealing with. So I'm allowing those to be angled. I'm allowing that to be set up. But I'm also coming in and starting to take into consideration, well, that's great. But what if somebody comes in here and they really wanted to have that fat line on the exterior of the building? So we can come through here. And I've even embellished things with very simple yes, no parameters. So as we're going through to turn this on, turn this off example. So I'm going to bounce back to my object, my detail component there, and we'll just talk about this real briefly. So inside of here, what I have the capability is I've just simply drawn reference lines to do this. So I'm going to go change the parameter of this real quick. We'll just put in a 15 degree angle on both of these ends. And what you can see inside of here is that I've associated lines to the angle parameter that's set up inside of here. And then when I drew the filled region, if I go edit the boundary on this filled region, this is just an invisible line. So when I grab this line here, you're going to see it's invisible, right? But if I grab the other boundary lines, well, those lines actually have the line weight that my standard happens to be. In this case, it's, a, it's an a one line weight. That's not a big deal, pretty simple. But then on top of that, I'm embellishing this with another O1 line, still constrained to the angle, still constrained to the reference lines. But that way, I have the capability to turn the visibility off and on of this object. I then basically do the same thing for the thick line side of things. I do it with a fatter line type, whatever my clients want to be dealing with there. And then I can come in and do, again, a visibility parameter to turn that off, object off and on. So I'm always addressing those things as I go through. Oh, as we create a piece of CMU, as we create a piece of brick, what do we need to do inside of there? I'll open that one up next. How are we going to go through and create this piece of brick? How are we going to go through and create this, this whatever we're talking about there? It's following that same concept, following the same line of knowledge on that. So, hey, I'm always calling that exterior, that fat line EXT for exterior line. I'm always setting this up to be what I wanted to do, etc. So just depending on how we're setting that up and what we're doing there, I'm going through and setting that up. So you'll see I'm opening up my brick family. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on all my reference planes again. You'll see I've got the parameters for the height, the joint, the thickness. This is pretty much identical to the out-of-the-box brick family. But what I've done is I've changed the line weights to match my standards. Then again, I have a nice fat line. I'm going to hide this real quick. But I have a nice fat line there still referencing that same parameter. That's going to be called my exterior line, my exterior face line. So again, just trying to maintain those standards through there. But what I've also done now inside of this family is I've started nesting other families. So when I want to come in here and have that this mortars inside of here, this you'll see is a nested other detail item. I'm going to go through there and I want to be able to show that there's a weak joint on this. Again, nested detail item. So I'm going to load this in a project, show you how it works, and then we're going to back reverse engineer this and start looking at what's going on. So same thing as the other the gypsum board. I've got this detail component. And in the properties, I can turn on the exterior face line. Exterior face line goes away. If I want to come back and say, you know, I don't want the mortar turned on, I can turn the mortar off. Or I can also come in here and say, you know, I'm going to want to weep head at that vent. So again, just the very same principles of nesting or mapping the visibility parameter of either nested files or lines, whatever, to give me that intelligence. Well, what is great about this is if I come in here and start doing a tag by category, I can tag that out, and it's tagged as unit masonry. But also notice, same family, I can tag and get the wheat vent, 
or even possibly tag, and I don't remember if I've got this, I don't have the mortar joint set up. So I can come through here and have the mortar joint tagged if I wanted to. So what's the difference? How is this happening? Why can I tag the weep but not the mortar joint? Well, let's go back to the family and really look at what's going on. I don't need that file. Okay. So when we come over here and start looking at what's going on, this weep vent is a nested family. The mortar joint is a nested family. You're going to see in my project browser over here, I've got my masonry joint. I've got my wheat family. We'll go ahead and open up those families. Ooh, I do not have those. Where's my wheat? So we're going to open up the masonry head wheat family. So what's kind of key about as you start getting into these families and nesting these, you're going to see that my masonry wheat family still has the same height and thickness parameter that basically like my brick had. Inside of this family, I'm also going to come over here and make sure that I am checking this is going to be shared. So what does it mean when I say this is going to be shared over here, right? This is all going to be shared. So that shared checkbox becomes crucial when you're talking about tagging through the detail. If I go back and edit the other family, let me get to my normal drawing mode. So if I come in here and go edit the other family, again, I'll go back into here. We will grab the masonry joint and edit this family. Now, notice this masonry joint family, shared is not checked. This is why I could not tag that object as I went through. The last client I did this for did not want the shared value checked. They don't call out the mortar joint independent of the brick. Some architects I have, they're like, ooh, we want to be able to call that mortar joint out as a cove, as a rib, or different types of cuts on the masonry joints. So for them, we tag shit, we hit shared, so therefore it can be tagged in each family. So no matter if it's the masonry or the weep joint, you're going to remember that when I was back in that family, and I'm just going to delete this out of here real quick. When I was back in that family, I had a height parameter, I had a width parameter, or thickness parameter, whatever. So when we start nesting those families in, I'm going to take this weep, and I've deleted it, so I'm going to put a new one, and I'm literally just going to place the family. I am a personal fan of dragging and dropping. If you really wanted to, you could do it just like you would in a project and go up to the Create tab, grab the detail component, and place it that way too. It doesn't really matter. But once you place that family, what you're going to do is you're going to grab that family and you're going to start mapping the parameters from thickness or height to other parameters in the project. So I'm going to come in here and see, okay, I've got that thickness parameter. I'm going to grab this little secret hidden button, as I like to call it, the little buttons off to the side there, which will allow me to map thickness from the weep family to thickness in the brick family. I do the same thing for the height values. You grab height, map height, and say OK. You'll notice that it automatically adjusted to match whatever the property of that brick was. You'll also see that the little shape handles we had become grips, letting us know that this is no longer going to stretch it, it's going to move it because we have that value mapped to another family. They changed the look of that in 2012, which was great, so we can actually start to see through our nested families that, oh, yeah, this was instance-based with a shape handle, but it's been mapped to something else. So just like any other type of family, now that that's done, what I want to do is align it to the insertion point or to the stretching point of my family. So I'm going to come up and grab my align command, and I'm going to grab my reference plane there, and I'm going to snap to basically the reference plane that's in that family. I'm going to hit the padlock. I'll do the same thing here. Hit the padlock. And boom, I basically just set that up to go through and understand that now I've mapped the parameter. It's going to adjust the thickness and the height. And it's going to also now, since it was shared, be able to be tagged as we start going through. So that's how we can start getting, again, more in-depth into these families. So again, any questions come up or any comments come up, feel free to type those as we're going through. So I'm going to close this family out. Don't really need to save it. And I want to start talking about like these rebar families. Because the one thing that you're going to see in this rebar family, and this one's a little bit different, it's kind of line-based, and these two are very, uh, very similar. But notice on my rebar family, again, it's thinking about how can we embed the intelligence, how can we make it consistent to possibly modeling information, that my rebar family, when I select it actually has a cover distance for the start and the end. I'll go make this ridiculous like three inches. 
So notice how when I did my cover on the end, it moved in three inches, and I did my cover on the start, it moved in. When I start creating content like this, I'm always starting to think about what's going to be the easiest way to place it. So if I'm coming in and placing any of these rebar families, for me, I want to be able to click on the edge of the object and click on the edge of the object then have that understand that, oh, I don't want to have to figure out I'm three quarters of an inch away. I don't want to have to figure out I'm three quarters of an inch away. Same kind of scenario. I'm going to go ahead and add this family. I want to add a parameter so that's much easier than trying to stretch it, change it, shape it, do what I needed to do inside of there. So this family, not much different than the line-based drywall family. We've got the length. Well, all I did was add a new reference plane and create a parameter for that. So that's pretty straightforward. I think if you've ever created a family, there's nothing new there. What this family then entailed is a nested family. So I have my detail item of my structural rebar in section. That detail item got nested into here. And I'm going to come through here, and I'm going to delete this. I'm going to actually delete all of these real quick, but not my control. Okay, so what I've done, just like in the past, I took my structural rebar. I'm going to drop one of these inside of here. I'm going to place it. Now, that structural rebar family has sizes to it. If I hit edit type, you're going to see there's a size value to this. If I wanted to take that size, I can actually come in here and say, ooh, I want to map the size parameter to the rebar size. So now when that's said and done, inside of my family, I can say, hey, go be a rebar size 6. It's going to update to be a rebar size 6. Go be a rebar size 4. It's going to update. So you'll see if I come down here and say I want this to be a rebar size 10, which is actually changing the value down here, I've now got a rebar size 10 family. So not only does that rebar size number here, and this is where we're getting a little bit more in depth to start adding some of this information, Rebar size is not only just contain, changing this radius of my rebar families, it's also being used in a whole bunch of other situations. I'm trying to stretch this out a little bit. So I've got a parameter called size. It's a simple integer parameter. Well, what size is doing is then controlling a radius. I'd love to be able to say take the size and divide it by um, an eighth of an inch. But the problem is, is all rebar is not simply decided, decided by an eighth of an inch. So when I start looking inside of here, I've done a very long nested if statement saying if size is less than 9, so if my integer becomes 8 or less, then take size and multiply it by 1, or divide it by 1 16th, therefore giving me the correct size. Then it's inside of there saying, well, but if it is an actual size 9, simply make it 9 16ths of an inch. If it's a size 10, make it 163. If it's a size 11, if it's a size 14, etc. Then what I've also done is if none of those values are true, make it a 316. So if somebody wants to come in and say, oh, hey, we're going to do a rebar size 13, which doesn't exist, it gives them a little toothpick. You get a little 316 inch radius file. So I've also built into the fact that if somebody tries to create a rebar size that doesn't exist, they end up with a toothpick, which really isn't going to support the billing. So, Brian, we have a, a quick question from Craig here. Uh, this may be basic, but how do you set your parameters to be instance base versus type base, like your cover offset? There's two-part answer to that. If it's not a system-based parameter, you can simply grab the value like cover, hit modify, and change it to be type or instance base. It's that simple. If you're creating that parameter, you can say it's type or instance based. The other way to actually do that is to simply grab the parameter on the screen and change it right here from instance to type. There's a little checkbox. Now it's a type. Now it's an instance. So this instance parameter on the screen, you have to do for certain values. So like if I'm doing like a 3D door family or other type of objects, I'm not going to be able to change like on casework the width to be an instance. By default, it's a parameter. It's a system parameter. I can't change that. So I can simply just grab that and change it. So, not a bad question for um, those people who are sitting there using, dealing with it. So, the other thing I wanted to show is I've got this size 10 here, right? And we talked about how that's updating the radius. I also have that controlling comments. And I don't see a lot of people doing this. I don't want people in my office to be able to go put whatever text value they want in there for the type comments. I always want this to be X, Y, or Z. 
So inside of here, I basically did the exact same thing I did up here with a very long conditional if statement, and it, it continues past there. My screen won't be wide enough to get to this one. But you'll see that it's basically saying, if size equals 3, then I put this in quotes, because this is a text value, say, quote, number 3 bar, end quote. If size equals 4, say, number 4 bar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start embedding intelligence inside of your families in a scenario like this as well. So that's what that number 10 or that size value is controlling, not only the radius of the bar, diameter of the bar, or it's also in this case controlling type comments. So just like before, you're going to see now that I've got the size mapped, what I truly want to start doing inside of here now is aligning and locking it just like I did before. So, but... I'm not going to necessarily do that right now, because in this case, what I wanted this to do was be an array parameter. So I'll use array parameters in like rebar. I've got array parameters in quite a few different families, what's going on. So in this case, I'm simply going to grab this array, this family, and array it. And it's up to you to choose, are you doing a move to second array or move to last? I'm going to do it move to last. And I'm just basically going to say start here and end here. Okay? So I've got this family arrayed. I've got two versions of this, and you'll also see that if I hover in the right location, I actually get that array um, value or that array parameter sitting there. So what I want to do is in the family grab that array dialog, because once you grab the actual array, you can label it just like any other value. So I can come up here and say, okay, I want to do an array, and I want to parametize the quantity for the array. So I'll come up here and grab the um, rebar quantity value that's already been calculated, and now you can see, boom, here we go. I've got that rebar already set. It's now parametized. So you can use these array parameters. The one thing I will put on the side note for array parameters is when you're doing this, be cautious, because when you start doing too many families with arrays, it can slow the process down when you start changing sizes of things, because Revit's got to redo all of the math that's built inside of there. I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying use them sparingly. I had a family from a few years back for the exit path for um, architects and their code sheets, and I had one that had the architect, one of these little arrowheads. Of course, being me, I took it to the next level and had feet and dog paw prints and boot prints and, and animal prints all over the place. It was kind of fun. But what the architect noticed actually was using arrows, the more and more of those they put in, the slower the file went. So just always be cautious of the more in-depth your families get. As you change them, it's got to start thinking about all the math. But since we've done this array, what you need to do in array is you need to constrain the two controlling array components in the family. So in this case, I did a move to last, so my two controlling is the first one and the last one. If you had done a move to second, it would be the first one and the second one. And what I need to do to those is constrain those controlling arrayed objects. So I'm going to come up again to use my align parameter. I'm going to grab the center reference plane, and I'm going to grab that center alignment. And notice what happens when I do this, how they're kind of going at an angle. If you don't constrain these aligned objects, this is what will start happening for you. You'll stretch it in the project and it'll start going off at crazy weird angles. Like, what's going on? I drew a line straight. Now they're stagger stepping all over the place. So I've done the first one. I'm going to align and lock the center of the second one. Right? But now I also need to align and lock the first one to my start, cover start, reference plane, and the last one to my cover in reference plane. So now I've just built into those the array and where that array is going to go to. With that said, how is my parameter controlling the quantity? How does it know to give me five of these? What was that set up? Well, in my scenario, I wanted the size to be calculated automatically. So I've come in here and created a parameter for the spacing. If you want one and a half foot spacing, then I've got one and a half foot spacing inside of them. Narrows down a little bit. So once I go and say one and a half feet, it's going to change the spacing on those. But it's not truly spacing that at one and a half feet. That's why I call this spacing max. This is how I wanted to set this family up. I've then said, okay, well, how is the quantity being figured out? Well, my quantity's also got another formula in it. So for my rebar quantity, I'm basically saying take the length, subtract the cover distance on the start, subtract this cover distance on the end, and then add the diameter, right? Radius times two. So I'm basically saying take those two things, subtract those, but add the diameter back in, and then simply divide that whole value times 
the maximum spacing. Now, I wanted to be able to figure out equal spacing, so then I added 1.5 to that. So it's going to actually round it up and add 1, which is the whole reason I did the 1.5. Now new to 2012 and 13, this family's kind of old, I could actually just say round up and get rid of the 0.5. But I wanted it to not have three in there. I wanted it to give me four, so the spacing would include one at the end. And that's where I had this set up. So it's, again, just using a formula, not that sophisticated of a formula, but using a formula to get this information to do what I wanted it to do. Now, the one thing that I've done that is slightly different, this spacing value and this rebar quantity value, I made shared parameters. So I went through and made things like this shared parameter. Now why would I make something like that shared parameter? Because that way when I'm in the project, I can actually create a tag that is going to look at that. So if I want to come in here and start grabbing this rebar that we've just placed, I'm going to go ahead and do an annotate. I'm going to go do a tag by category. I'm going to grab this nice number five bar here. And you're noticing that when I grab this, it's just coming in here grabbing the number five bar. But again, because I built it into there, if someone goes and chases to number seven, the bar updates and the text updates, etc. So I've got that intelligence built into this flat 2D object. But the other thing inside of here is I should also, and I might not have this tag loaded, I should have possibly another tag, which I don't have loaded, so we will go grab it. Um, actually, I think that's still in my 2012 folder. I don't think I've upgraded that one yet. So, detail components, detail tag for my rebar. We'll go ahead and load this into the project. So, I've created a detail tag for rebar. So, what can happen now is I can just change out the default tag to be my rebar tag. And it's going to pick up on the bar size, but also the spacing that I built into there. So this is a number nine bar at one foot on center. So I've done, I do a lot with shared parameters to start tagging the information I want to tag. What's great about this is if I come in here and say, oh man, I didn't want maximum one foot spacing. I wanted eight inch spacing. Boom, my rebar tag is going to update. The 3D geometry is going to update. So it's really starting to get that information inside of there. Now, the other thing that people think I'm crazy on is if I go edit this family, I've built in basically the same things. Um, that is not the right one. I want the rebar size. Let's change that family real quick. So I've got one that's rebar side spaced. Same thing. If I added this family, it's got the same cover start, the same cover end. So I could go add my three quarters of an inch, like on both sides, whatever it may be. But I've got those same rebar spacing. Why do I need rebar spacing on this? I'm not visibly seeing it. Well, because I know in my detail, I basically want to be able to call that out in the detail. So it's really starting to get into those embedded families, starting to nab those nests to them, et cetera, to do what we wanted to do there. So the next component I want to show, and I don't think I have it in this detail, those are all pretty simple things, um, is my door jam detail. So we'll go back to 2013 families. I'm going to go into my openings. So you notice that this is going to be more obviously architecturally related. But when I come in here, I've got this door hollow metal rabbit. And when you start to oops, look at this and think about it, it's like, man, why is there only one of those doors? What if it's a wood door? What if it changes sizes? What if this door goes to a, wall, a metal frame? What if it's going to concrete? What if it's you know, different scenarios on a door jam? Yet I only have one detail component for this. So if you're going to start looking at this object, I've got a whole bunch of different nested families inside of here. So this family itself, I don't think is actually made up of anything. I think everything inside of this family is actually a nested object. So I believe the jam might be the only thing. And let me see on this one. Yeah, that's the only masking region built inside of here. Everything else besides these lines are nested detail components. Because you're going to notice that even the door leaf, not a simple nested detail component, this is also, or not a simple masking region, this is also a nested detail component. Because when I load this into a project, and I can simply place this family in my project, what's great about this family is now I can select it and I've got all these options. What leaf type are we going to put inside of here? I'm not doing a hollow metal leaf, I'm doing a wood leaf. 
boom, I can get that set and change. I should probably come through and tag some of these too so we can actually uh, see the, well, of course, that just says scheduled hollow metal door frame. Dang it. But here's the hollow metal anchor. We're just going to throw some tags on here. Scheduled wood door. And by the way, you might have to use the tab key to schedule some of this information. So it wasn't grabbing that door leaf for me. I actually had to tag the door or tab to get to the door leaf. So, you know, kind of what you're looking for there. But what's great about this is not only can I change the leaf type out. Okay, great. What type of clip am I using? Oh, well, I'm going into my um, door clip. It's going to be going into a stud. I want that to snap around a metal stud. So you can see that as I go through here, it's now changed to be hollow metal frame anchor, scheduled hollow metal door frame. Oh, well, no, let's go say we're not going into a stud. And this time we're going to be going into concrete and we want a sleeve anchor. So you can start to see that as I get this set up, when I start going through this, I can embed the intelligence in there. So I'm not having to, every time I do a door, every time I do rebar, assemble all this information, I can pre-build all that information into it. There's also even in this case a nested screw, so if I wanted to tag the screw or the fastener out, I could definitely tag that fastener as well. So how was that done? How did we create that? Well, let's go back to the family. So when you saw me grab the array in the rebar family, I took that array and I went and labeled that array with the quantity just like you would a dimension. Whatever you take and drop in a nested detail component, that's actually two in BD models too, so I guess I should say a nested component, I can take that nested component and I can choose to create a label just like we would do with the dimension or the array. We can come in here and create a label. So you're going to see in my family, I've got a couple different label parameters, leaf type, and I've got the exact same thing for set fastener type. Well, what kind of parameters are those? When I come over here and hit the add, how do I know Revit's going to do family parameter, I'm going to call it. How does Revit know what to select and grab? Well, when you come down to your group parameters, not your group, your type of parameters, notice at the very bottom there's a family type. So hopefully, you can use a raise of hands if you guys want to show me. You can raise your hand if you've actually used the family type parameter. I use this all the time. I do it in 3D families. I go through and I, you know, do it. It looks like a few of you guys have used it. I do it in 3D families. I do this all the time because I'm kind of under the opinion of, you know, I go through, I do it once. I create one family that allows me to swap out for others. So I don't have to maintain 500 different families. I can have one that has options embedded into it. So don't use it all the time, but I do use it quite often. Doors, windows, things like that. A lot of different scenarios. So when you come down here and say you're going to create a family type, what's bizarre in a scenario like this is we then have to choose, well, what nested family types are you going to want to be using? Are you nesting in a level head? Are you nesting in a lighting device? Well, in this case, no, we're nesting in detail items, formerly known as detail components, right? I don't know if anybody noticed that in 2013. So just me, I don't know, I blogged about this, detail items or now, actually, I didn't blog. This is for my upcoming um, Autodesk University presentation. 2013, they renamed them from detail components to detail items. So we've got like this now same track. Half the things in Revit called detail items. Half of the time, they were called detail components. They've gotten consistent, and they're all called detail items now. So in this case, I'd be grabbing a detail item object. Where do you want to group that under? Constraints, graphics, general. I'm going to throw this under general right now just to break it up from the other things. And you can see now I've got this family parameter called detail items. So once that's done, now what I can do is grab this object and go assign it to that label of family parameter. Now, whoa, wait, what just happened? I changed it and modified it. And the reason I wanted to do that is when you create that parameter, it looks to the very first family you have alphabetically, numerically in your file. So, oops, I didn't want it to be that one. I really wanted it to be one of the leaf families. There we go. It then comes down to the same thing. You're going to map any nested parameters you have. So I would be mapping the thickness parameter to the, hmm, I think it's thickness. Nope. To the thick parameter. See what happens when you come back to a family a year later. And I'm going to go ahead and grab the length parameter and max it to the, I think I have a leaf length or something like that. Hmm, gem, 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 depth. Oh, 
I don't know. I did that one. Now, in this case, I just aligned and locked it. So in this case, I'm not actually mapping the length parameter to it. What I actually did to this one, and I'll go ahead and rotate this real quick. Um, what I did on this one was just align and lock it. So in this scenario, I wanted it to stretch with its height value, or, but I didn't actually use the height value because I'm going, no, it shouldn't be the height value. That should work. I lied. Let me go map this to the height value. There we go, <laughs> which is spelled wrong. Got to love it when I do that. So now you can see that's done. I'll just delete this one out of here for now. Same scenario, once that's all done, I'm going to align and lock it. It goes up here to the top there, and this is actually going through right to the door jam. Although, technically, that's not right to this one. And I lock it. So you've got those values going through, setting it up, doing what you want to do, nesting into what it needs to be nested into. So that's really how we can start getting into creating some of those detail components, is creating those original families, making them shared or not, nesting them into what you needed to nest them into. So I'm going to go back to that, real, go back to my project real quick. So you can see now the beauty of that. Did I do that in a different view? I must have. There we go. So now the beauty of this, when we get into it, is you've got all of those objects. You can nest them, you can tag them, and again, you're getting into that consistent information. Now, I believe last time we talked about it, but I do want to cover it and come in here because I usually get the comment of, you know, that's great, but especially as a structural engineer, go back to the other file. Yeah, it's this one. So as a structural engineer, you know, that's great, but I can't really just sit here and tag number nine at eight inches on center. I'm going to need to be a little bit more descriptive. I need to say at horizontal, vertical, parallel, perpendicular, at X, Y, Z locations. So you're going to notice that in a lot of my tags, if I click in here to edit the tag, I also always add comments to this. So I'm tagging the size. I'm tagging the maximum spacing. Again, both shared parameters. But what I wanted to do is add information to comments. So if I come in here and grab this element, and I say, ooh, I want to add comments to this, um, horizontal, vertical, whatever you might want to say. And this could even be a very long novel. Kind of hard to type inside of this little dialog box, box, but it can be as long as you want it to be. You can also copy and paste it. And I've got comments that I want to do that are extremely, extremely long. What I will actually do is go in like Notepad or some other document, type it in, copy it, come in here, paste it in the comments. So you can see I've got this horizontal, even very long novel type in this dialog box. So I can add those comments. What's great is if I come down and tag this same thing, right, we'll probably change this to be a number nine to match. If I come in here and, oops, that's not what I wanted. I wanted that family. I'll make this one a number nine. So if I come in here and tag this one now, it's the exact same family, number nine, whatever. But if I go tag that one, I'm not getting that same very long dialogue because that's specific to this one in comments. I've also had people ask me, well, what happens if I change that from the sections to the parallel? Well, those comments are still going to understand and stay there. Even if I swap it out, I've got the same information inside of the comments. So it's kind of one of those nice things. If you set up that way, you need to type in a novel. You still can. You still have that flexibility to go through and deal with that. Well, we got a question from Greg. Can you edit the text box width? No, I really wish we could. That's one of been my wish list items. And that's a hint to everybody else. Go put on your wish list items for Autodesk that we would love the tags to be able to be selected and stretch the width of our tag. We unfortunately can't. I know that's a limitation to the text or the label inside of that tag, but God, that would be nice. I mean, AutoCAD Architecture has that. It's an Autodesk product. They brought that out like in 2010. So. Yeah. <laughs> I wish we could. It's one of the ones I, I'm pretty sure it's in the works, but it's been in the works for a while, and they're having some serious issues with um, programming on the text, text scenario. So what I usually do is I create different tags, one that's like three inches wide, one that's four inches wide, etc. The one thing for me is you'll kind of see I've got all these little boxes here. These boxes are how I detail. So these little orange boxes that are inside of here, we can go through and set up and say, oh, okay, I usually have these definitely set up to be like, this is where it goes. And this one doesn't actually match, but most of my dialog boxes then fit within my detailing grid. So I always come through here and have this nice detailing grid set up to be, okay, I need to be this width. So my text matches my detailing grid. 
that's how I've set it up and dealt with it. So I've got these nice little structured format on how I go through in detail. But you're absolutely right. Adjusting the text width would be great. So hopefully we'll get that at some point in time. Philip, I see your hand up on the screen here. Uh, if you had a question, do you want to uh, type it in? Um, when having a shared nested detail component for the door head. There it is. I think we kind of... Sorry, wrong chat window. <laughs> hmm. Philip, if you have your question, I don't understand when having a shared nested detail component for the door head. And then you said wouldn't. Almost seems like you're, as you're typing, you're touching the touchpad on your laptop and clicking in other parts of your program. Wouldn't it be a problem where you can choose that un under instance parameter? Um, choose what? Go back to the door head one. I don't know why I did these in different details, but sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll go back to the text box issue in a minute, Juliana. So we'll let Philip finish typing. So Juliana, what the question was is can you adjust the size of the text width? So not the text width itself, but the width of the box. Yes, in the tag I can have it be boxed and adjust automatically with the text. But the question was I really wanted that very long note to be able to stretch to say, hey, in this view I want to stretch it to be this wide to fit, or in this view I want to make it one line. I think that's kind of what the question was, is because in Revit, we don't have the capability to define how wide that tag is going to be. So, yes, I could go into the tag and have it be boxed, and have the box adjust with the text, but I think the question was, is how do we predetermine or how do we adjust inside of it? Okay, and getting back to Philip, if I have many detail, uh, components. detail components in the project, then you can choose oh. anything in the project, which includes... Uh, the detail components like window jam or something. Got it. So what, Phil, yeah, and this is a downside to this. So, and as you get into large projects, so when I came in here and I'm looking at, oh, I want to do the leaf type, you can see that I can get all of these other things inside of here, and I can even try to make it the masonry head on the weep side. So probably not something I want to do. And this kind of is one of those things to me that is a downside to that, that it will allow you possibly to change things, swap them out, if you try to change it to something that it really won't let you do, it might yell at you, I can't create that element, or it, you might have issues with it. When that comes up, it's just, I'm very careful at my naming. That's why you'll see all the nested components, like, oh, you can only grab something that's an 081. You should only be grabbing something that's this, et cetera, et cetera. And that's trying how I go through to deal with it, and I explain to the users that, yes, you can grab a freaking piece of rebar and dump it in there if it's a shared value, but... It doesn't allow me to, you just have to pay attention. I mean, yeah, it's going to break if people aren't paying attention, but I try to just make it set up that way. So good good point, Philip, and that does become very, very deceiving. When you get in a large project, you might have 100, 200, 300 options in there. That's why it's big for me to go through and very, I mean, you can see I me. Mean, this is an 081 door clip. This is an 081 door leaf. I'm very conscious of how I name things. And so when people go into there, they shouldn't have to be scrolling forever in a day to find the other one. They should all be grouped together because it does do it off of naming. You're absolutely correct, Philip. It is a concern. A person who's not familiar with this is going to come in and break it. But it's also, if they're not familiar with detail components, they're going to draw filled regions everywhere anyway. So it's just all about educating the users and hope they listen to how you're educating them. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, and let me go see if I can find this file real quick, is when you start getting into creating details and the detail components, I really want to be able to come inside of here and then start creating standard details. And so I've got one that's all wall types, and I think I have the latest file I've been working on here. I'm not actually sure. So we'll go ahead and see if I can get this open up and find my nice little details here. Oh, I think I actually froze my screen, so hold on one second. We'll get to the right view, and then I think my screen got frozen on this. So I'm currently working on this for one client, and what I have inside of here is I've obviously all detail components, right? And what you'll see inside of this is a standard um, type that they use for wall assemblies in their, in their office. 
What you'll see over here is if I actually grab the object, notice how the text value over here works. This client uses keynoting as opposed to text with type comments. That's fine. But you'll notice as I just start grabbing these objects, everything over here is updating. But what I've done on this as well is you'll also see that in a standard detail for something like this, when I grab this piece of um, masonry anchor, notice you've got all these padlocks. When I grab the, the, the CMU or the stud or whatever it is in the different types of detail I'm doing, you're going to start to see all of these objects. Because what you're going to see in here is as I come in here and be like, oh, I don't want this to be a 6-inch metal stud. Maybe I wanted that to be an 8-inch metal stud or a 4-inch metal stud or whatever. As I change that, all the components moved with it. Because I took the time to go through and just like I would in a family, align and lock everything. So I took that gypsum wall board, aligned and locked it to the stud. I took that um, vapor retarder, aligned and locked it to the stud. You'll also notice, and this is kind of a downside of Revit, that as you start doing that, you might have objects move on you. You can come over and see, oh great, look at that, this object moved on me. So I can come in here, grab this and have to maybe start nudging the text values down, et cetera, et cetera. Looks like I'm not finding the right keynote file. But you can start to see kind of a drag part when we get into that. But, you know, this just is how it is. And I use my shift key. Um, we can really just start going in there and updating it. But notice how the text would have updated had I had the right keynote file. Um, the text would update. All the information updates. And it pretty much maintains what's going in there. So all of this information can be set, go through. Yes, Juliana pointed out the insulation did not update because I can't align and lock the insulation because the insulation is actually a width of a detail component. So I could go change that detail component out instead of being 6 inches, being my 3 and 5 eighths. Grab this detail, repeating detail component, change it to be my 3 and 5 eighths. And boom, then I could go ahead and move those both up the distance they need to get moved. So it doesn't do it for everything. But, you know, starting to get that through, so as people come in and start changing their minds, oh, I want to change this, the width of the stud, all the components go with it, as opposed to having somebody go through and move, 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 move and constantly have to be updating it. Yeah, it's a drag. I've got to move the text. Oh, craggy, I just moved the insulation. The insulation moved again, you know, kind of scenario. But it's just one of those things that, as long as you understand that's what it's doing, go through, set it up. All the information is going to be intelligent. It's all going to update. I wish I had the right keynote file because that would have said 4-inch metal stud as opposed to 6-inch metal stud. But you really can start going through and setting that up. So as you get into those components, feel free to set them up. You know, I'm very big about nested components. Like even inside of this, and this engineers might like, if I'm in a seismic area, I check I'm in a seismic area, and it adds my seismic tie. Same thing back up here on this one. If I come in and say, oh, yeah, this is still in a seismic area, boom. I've just added my seismic tie. Ooh, interesting. I got moved to the back. I've just added that seismic tie inside of there, and now I can come through and boom, there you go. I've got the seismic tie drawn in. So just one of those things I'm always thinking about, okay, when I create a component, what situations are possible that I'm going to need? I usually spend more time researching a component than it actually takes me to create it. So I know on this um, masonry veneer anchor. I think I created it in about 20 minutes and it took me like an hour and a half to research it. So exactly what kind of components on there, what are the different manufacturers, which manufacturer do I want to base it on because I'm not actually making it for the manufacturer, what are all the options. You'll also see that I come inside of this one like what are the pencil lengths. It gives me the actual pencil sizes that they make, the four, the four, the three quarters, the three, the five, so I can change the pencil length because maybe I was going to put a thicker insulation in, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, everything's not perfect, but it's a nice start to get people going through what they needed to do. Very good. No questions right now? No, no questions. Well, see, I was planning on getting done about 10 minutes early because I thought there would be more and, questions and, coming in. And do you have any questions? I mean, I know some of you haven't seen session one and session two, but do you have any general questions on detailing right at the moment? We've got about 10 minutes left. So the last thing I'll talk about, since it doesn't look like there's any questions right now, okay. we'll questions that do come up. <laughs> the one thing that I did want to talk about, I did blog about this, so if you want this family, it's actually on my um, my website, on my blog. But if I get into, um, let's go to my Revit families, 2013 detail components. One thing to me that is huge that everybody should have, you've seen the nice little orange grid I have floating around there. I think everybody really should have 
truly in a project, a nice detailing grid family. This family is a generic annotation family. And the reason it's a generic annotation family is it will scale up and down depending on the scale of what's going on inside of the inside of your view. So if I put this in an inch and a half scale view, it will become the right size. If I put it in a six, uh, three quarters of an inch view, it will become the right size. And then inside of here, I've built in a whole lot of different values for this. So basically, I can come in here depending on the sheet size I'm dealing with. Like, ooh, this is going to be a 24 by 36 inch sheet. Instructional engineers, you might actually like this too because you can then customize this to any architect's title block. So yeah, the architects are using a 24 by 36 inch sheet. They've got a you know one inch border at the top. They've got a one inch border at the bottom. They only go with a one inch border on the left. And I change all of this, and it updates the size of this for that architect. I forgot to delete that line. So they updates the size of this to match the architect's file. Then I can come back and say, well, okay, great. How many rows and columns would this be using? So you'll see pre-built in upside of here. I can say there's going to be three columns and four rows, and it's going to update the size for three columns, four rows, etc. So great little family to have, and that's what you're actually seeing back inside of this view. So when you come in here and look at this view, I've got this nice little detail box. And this is a very old detail box. Let's go grab the other one and load it back in. I've got too many files open. We'll leave that open. Don't need that. Okay, so we'll load this into our project. We'll throw it inside of here. So it's kind of one of these scenarios. You go through, you set this up. What's great is as you go to start a detail, like in the 3D view, whatever, you choose what you're going to do. I use it for wall sections, building sections, and large floor plans. I use it everywhere. But this is a detail where we have four on a sheet, so we've got a four by four size. Actually, let's go edit the type on this one. I still have a teeny tiny sheet size. Um, we'll do 30 inches by 42. So here's the amount of room I have. If I were to place four of these wide by three columns high, and I've pre-built that into this family, so four columns, four rows. So then theoretically, when you drag all these drafting views onto a sheet and you stack them up four by four, they're going to fit perfectly inside of there. Now you know that you've got this much room to detail in, this much room to notate in, etc. It's basically what you're seeing over here. I just pre-laid these out. This is a whole different thing that I was teaching in another session. So whole scenario, now I know text goes here, areas go over here. I've improved on it slightly where dimensions go here, here, and here. Here's about where I want you to put all the text and the arrows. And then here's where once it's placed on the sheet, the view title should be getting drugged to as well. So. One of those things that I think also totally benefits what's going on, and even if you're in, I don't think I'm in a 3D file, am I? Let's go open up a 3D file. We'll open up our beautiful warming hub file that everybody sees me use all of the time. So we'll go into a section, and let's say I wanted to go and create a call out, or I wanted to start, you know, doing whatever. I'll go drop this call out in. We're going to do this foundation detail. Then I go to that call out view. And now once I'm in this callout view, I go ahead and dump in this guide grid family because now once I'm in that, that file, I can go ahead and place this symbol. I did say symbol. Done with that. Get too many views open. So, so now I can go in here and it is a symbol because it's a generic annotation. So I can go to my symbol command. Grab the guide grid and notice how big it is compared to that view. It's like, oh, well, this is a detail where we're going to go four by four. We'll dump this inside of here. And now I broke the four by four. I should have fixed that before I loaded it. We'll go four by three. That's how much room I have to detail. Go turn off my crop region real quick. So there's my crop region. And, uh, annotated crop region is what I wanted to turn off. Excuse me. So there's my symbol inside of here. And notice that's a half inch scale. Well, I want to do this an inch and a half. Now it's getting a little bit more to match. But this is the amount of space I have to do this inch and a half detail in. So as you start changing those details, as you start changing the scale, boom, now I know that, oh, okay, for my standards, I kind of need to pull this crop region in a little bit. I'll pull the crop region in here. The bubble's obviously updating. But now I've really got this information all set up to, okay, now I fit within the standards of where I need to be detailing.
you want the grid line in there, you can stretch the grid line down within the bubble for the dimensions, etc. And now you're good to go to do your detail. So this to me is one of the huge things that I need to do to go get there and set up. So somebody asked me, where is that detail format located? It's on my um, blog. So if you go to bdmackieconsulting.com, there's a nice Revit Geek blog, or you can just Google Revit Geek, and I'll come up with my blog. And it was, I'll just call it a guide. You just Google guide. There's a detailing guide grid. You can download the family from that blog. It talks about how to use it, how it's been set up, and you can reverse engineer that file as you see fit. So now with that, we have just enough time for our conclusions. Well, and we will try to uh, talk Mr. Mackey into uh, allowing us with proper credit to uh, post that on our website. Yeah. Perhaps. So we'll let you know. Yeah, you guys can sure cab one. We'll throw a link to that directly. Yeah. But so anyway, there there aren't any real questions uh, at this point. Um, so we'll give it a minute here. Anything else you want to kind of cover here before? Uh, we, we close off, give people the last couple seconds. Well, the only thing I would like to probably finish off with is the fact that in November we're going to be covering the webcast for November is going to be massing. So how can we truly use the um, conceptual massing to generate not only conceptual masses, but realistic things in the world as well. Exactly. And just a, a plug for uh, both Brian and uh, Desi Mackey. They will both be speaking at uh, Autodesk University the week after Thanksgiving, I think that's the 27th through the 29th this year of November, uh, if I remember right. Anyway, it's that week after Thanksgiving. And if any of you are headed out that way, um, you know, stop by their class. Or I believe that those again this year will be uh, transmitted at some point. Yeah, usually they post them a few months later for everybody yeah. to go view and watch. And you can also go see previous ones. I know. Um, does he actually got some comments today on some of the ones he's spoken in the past year or so? Yeah, very good comments, by the way. So anyway, folks, if, if there are no more questions, doesn't look like there are, we appreciate it. We hope these are of value to you. Uh, we will be, this will be recorded and hopefully successfully recorded, and we will be able to post it on our YouTube channel in a, a few days, and the link to that will be on CAD1. Uh, events archives page and so you can look for that as well uh, as well as the other two sessions and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next webinar so thanks very much bye thank you